You are listening to Transmissions from the Planet Zog, Milo and Teal, Book One, Birds of a Feather. Chapter Five, Milo's Second Invention. Milo was working on something exciting. Having completed the new treehouse extension with Teal, he now had more time to develop and investigate something new. And this new was holding his attention riveted this sunny morning. You might think these children were on holiday from school. I certainly wouldn't blame you for believing that, but this was their school. Every so often Milo and Teal would check in at the school buildings in the village to gain or cement new friendships, build ideas or work or play with others. They might upload a report of their week in order to track their own knowledge development, but there would be no teachers waiting for them, expecting completed homework or testing them in exams. Zogians knew that each person has their own interests. Give them the means to pursue these and you gave the perfect learning system without anyone telling you what to do or what was right and what was wrong. School was a collective body of learning and experience that everyone could use, regardless of their age. Milo had been playing with his father's crystals all week. He sat up on the floor at home, bottom warmed from the heated steam piped beneath the stone and oak floor of the house, placing crystals about him like a great arc of coloured stones. He had quartzes, jaspers, amethysts, opals, knobbly gold nuggets, peridots, sapphires, silicas and agates, lovely chunks the size of his small hand. His father, Fredal, had been singing with him and explaining how crystals helped to transmit sounds out across and around their planet, even into deep space. Milo sat and sang his songs, one at a time into each of the crystals, carefully feeling them in his lap afterwards to assess which were more charged with his sound vibration. The experience of the last few days with his father of programming the huge chunks of crystals kept around the fields to keep the crops protected had worked his way deep into Milo's mind. He was fascinated, hooked. Young as he was, he could feel how songs, words and meaning could be held within the crystal lattices of the large blocks of quartz his father used, carefully emitting a frequency which suggested to any crop-eating animal that their presence was most unwelcome. You and I know a little bit about quartz, don't we? We know that watches can be powered by quartz with the help of a battery. We know that quartz is used in computers, the famous silica chip, somehow carefully storing all the data we might need again in its switch-on, switch-off coding power of tiny moving electrons. Zogians just took this further and more naturally, playing with the switch and movement of iron energy in crystals to influence all manner of different everyday processes, from the powering and memory in their pods to creating force fields around agricultural fields to amplifying and transmitting particular sounds. This, the singing in of the stones with his father. Year to year, his father liked to tweak the song he chose, and this time he had invited the very keen Milo to help him. They'd also prepared goodies, which were laid out in the surrounding woods for animals who may have wanted to enjoy the benefit of munching the highly nutritious young crops. Instead of munching the young juicy shoots of the new vegetables which his father so successfully grew, small mammals could eat of the extra harvests which were distributed at regular intervals in the ring woods about the fields. The balance of numbers was maintained by having the natural predators of those animals living near to the villages. The people were protected from these predators' presence in much the same way as the crop crystal rings protected their vegetables. Balance was the most important principle on Zog. It was all about balance in flux and flow. So Milo sat there, surrounded by glorious and to us highly valuable crystals, as Teal arrived home from her visit to Emmeline. What are you up to there, Milo? asked Teal as she took off her flying jacket, a second skin to keep the wind chill from cooling her as she flew with Emmeline in the new machine. I'm practising, affirmed Milo. Dad told me we could go to the SEKs and programme the crystals there. With cousin Tanias, exclaimed Teal, who loved this particular cousin. He was gifted in her mind for having the perfect long legs for her to climb up and turn somersaults on. We can sing into the Essie crystals. Did he really, really say that? Oh, yes, he did. But Dad said I had to practice first, so I've gathered all the crystals I could find around the house. Mum helped me, and that's where they're all laid out on Mum's rug. This isn't one of Mum's rugs, Milo. This one is a special one Emmeline's mother made for Mum. It's what got her inspired in the first place. And Teal knelt down to get a closer look at this marvellous furry picture covering the wooden floor. The mandala. 
not dissimilar to the patterns Emmeline was now encouraging her leaves to grow into beneath her treehouse. This rug was made of every kind of animal fur and hair you could imagine, even human hair. This piece would last for centuries. Teal had overheard her mother saying she would clean it regularly, leaving it outside to air out the dust, but bands of colours subtly and contrastful wove in circles and arcs through the circular mat, and where Milo was sitting, plumb in the middle, he easily had the perfect pattern to lay out his many gemstones. May I arrange them by colour, Milo? They might tune better for you that way. If I put the ones most like e each other in the same area, or well, that way, just like happy plants grow together, their energetic frequencies could rub off one another and strengthen the individual fields of resonance you're making? This could sound rather technical as a conversation for a 12-year-old to be having with her 9-year-old brother, but I can assure you these areas of knowledge were so inbuilt into the daily experience of every person on Zog from the moment they were born that there was nothing whatsoever impossible about Teal saying what she did. If you go and study crystals yourself, you'll find out about their wonderful lattice structures of molecules and how the energy in their atoms is held together through powerful bonds holding in electrons, protons and neutrons in the perfect place. That might be where the textbooks for your age end, and the rest you'll have to glean from discussions with other clever people who like to dabble in quantum physics. Energy is still an area on Earth which, for some strange reason, the scientists like to keep to themselves. Perhaps they don't quite believe the results they get from their, set, their experiments, results which cause them to question so many other assumptions they've long held as absolute truths in their lives, let us rest knowing that Teal could feel the truth of what she discussed with Milo, just as Milo had a fine enough and sensitively schooled ability to judge and discriminate between different resonant sound frequencies. He was teaching himself to judge what qualities were most needed by different stones as he sang into them, programming them with his message. And what was his message? Well, Teal wanted to know too, as she sweetly hummed to herself and rearranged her brother's beautiful collected possessions. Milo, what are you asking the crystals to hold for you? I can see you stones here of almost every rainbow colour and almost every degree of hardness. I'm just experimenting, playing around, tasting them, feeling my way into them. That, that's what Dad advised me to do before we go to Essie. He said that in Essie, the crystals are so big that you need real focus to make any impact on them at all. I should say so. Do you know how large those stones in Essie are, Milo? Teal quizzed him, knowing the answer herself from her long discussions with Tanias while spinning monkey-like on his long arms and legs. As Milo only shook his head, concentrating on the crystal in his cupped hands, a block of beautifully cubed sapphire, Teal took it upon herself to inform her brother. They are as wide as half of our house, and as long as from here to our tree house. We could live in one of them if they're that big, if it was hollow like this gold crystal here, said Milo, now taking up the twisted worm-like globule of raw gold ore into his small hands. Yes, we could, agreed Teal, but I doubt those crystals would ever be hollowed out. They're the ones chosen to grow over long years, and I doubt any person is going to touch them and start carving chambers within their crystal walls. We need them too much for our pod transmissions. Imagine if we couldn't tell Mum and Dad where we'd gone off on our adventures or when we were going to come be, be back for meals. <laughs> what then? Without power to transmit to our pods, we'd go hungry and limited to only being able to roam about the village. No more adventures? Milo briefly looked sad, brightening as he remembered that this was not the case. So, no hollow crystals... Well, let's keep them all in, Essie. We can go running off for miles as often as we like. Yes, we can, said Teal. I cannot imagine doing anything else. Those poor children on the planet Earth. Emmeline told me that Isabel, who visited from Earth, said children cannot go off on their own because the parents worry too much. Apparently there are dangers all over the place and no one can be trusted. Children even go missing. Well, that's a horrible thing, said Milo. I'm sure it can't be true. Well, perhaps not, said Teal. But Emmeline did say that everything Isabel told them was confirmed in their observations of Earth. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah, strange, said Milo. I'm glad we live here. So am I, said Teal, finishing off her arrangement of gems through the rainbow, completely encircling her smaller brother. There, I've done it. We have a rainbow about you, Milo. Now sing your rainbow songs and let's see what synchronistically comes our way today. 
I bet you will be seeing spectrum colours in the hanging crystals at the windows, in the etched edges of the window panes or the quartz edge of the pool outside, even if we don't see one in the sky. And Teal became excited, as she always did, when imagining new possibilities. Hey, you could make a rainbow deliberately. Just concentrate with your crystals and see how fast one comes. You know it's only a matter of 68 seconds of mental or emotional focus. Go on! And she skipped around the rug with anticipation. You make a rainbow, Teal. I already know what I'm creating with these. What? said Teal. A beam into space at Essie, replied Milo. I'm calling up the crystals in the ground to help me when I go to sing in the giant ones. I reckon that if I enlist the help of all those different minerals, then I'll have the strength to transmit a signal. I want to see if Mum can pick up the signal I send back here at home on her pod while I'm all the way in Essie. But she could do that anyway with your pod via the libraries, Milo. Teal had a grasp on how vibrational messages were transmitted on Zorgi, even if she was yet to use the libraries personally by physically visiting them. It will be a different kind of signal, one you cannot store in the library. I want to surprise Mum with that song you wrote for the bird. I want her to hear it coming out of the air while she's sitting around the house doing something else like weaving or cooking us a delicious meal. You mean pick up through our crystal pool, said Teal, waving towards the garden with its well water filtered in a deck deep pool of transparent crystal. It was used for storing drinking water as well as transmitting device for information to and from the larger libraries. Large distances between places meant that more power was needed than just an ordinary pod range. The pods were the biological computers each Zorg citizen kept with them. They could record images and thoughts, measure feelings and replay moving images. They could also access and reference most information on the planet as well as be used to communicate with each other. Both Milo and Teal had one, which they used at times throughout each day, despite their young ages. It's an interesting idea. I've never heard the pool singing, mused Teal. But Mum did tell me about it one day. The day that girl Isabel arrived here, all the pools started humming simultaneously. Every system had gone into overload, it seemed. That's a funny thing, said Milo. Well, I couldn't do that, but perhaps a little hum of my song will arrive if I concentrate right now and get it right. You'll never get it right, Milo, because you'll never stop tweaking it to be better. I like the way you're always improving everything you try your hand at. It never gets boring having you around. I'm glad you decided to be born and be my little brother, Milo. I'd have to travel about the village so much more if I didn't have you in the family. Tanias and all those adults are always discovering new things. Mum told me they improve their systems daily, especially at Essie and in the libraries. And I bet that's just what you'll be doing too. Teal was an effervescent kind of a sister. She always said what she felt, which was mostly happy. Milo benefited from her excitement and her older years. He could bounce off plans and ideas and often found himself interested and engaged in projects which would ordinarily have been deemed way beyond the, capa the capabilities of a person of his age. Age meant not much to his mind. All he thought about was the thrill of discovery, the satisfaction of envisaging a project through his imagination and getting to the gritty details of building whatever it was that he was currently passionate about. OK, you might be correct, he'll thank you. I might work this out first time round, and I might not. Either way, it should be a hoot to attempt to make our pond spit out my singing voice and singing one of your songs. boy," said Teal encouragingly. She liked earthisms. You know, it may well be my song, but it's you who have the lovely voice, I've always told you. And one day soon, Tanias will actually invite us to Essie and you will get to see the effect your voice has on those crystals directly. You mark my words. Milo was now feeling a little abashed. His singing voice was lovely, but somehow he always felt a little self-conscious about it, which was odd, as no one he had ever met could explain to him this particular emotion. It seemed that no one suffered from this any more, unlike us on Earth, where it was often positively cultivated in families. He decided to change tack a little and ask after his sister, removing the pressure he could feel upon himself, so he casually asked her, Anyway, what did you do today at Emmeline's? Mum said you were with her in a new flyer. Teal, eager to talk about her adventures with Emmeline, her wondrous floor, and the honeybird replied, I was just moseying about her treehouse, discussing birds and nests and patterns and things. I have an idea which I'm going to work on and Emmeline might help me. We can show you when we've done some more on it. Did you know, Teal, said Milo, 
I heard from Fonny talking about that Isabel that children on earth have to go to something they call school, but it's the opposite of ours. Yeah, I heard that too, replied Teal. Sounds like a kind of prison place where parents leave them and they all have to agree on everything. Milo was quite carried away for a moment with something which did not feel so good. That's such a horrible idea. I almost didn't realise it had the same name as our favourite place, the school. They don't have tree houses, they don't even have trees in many of them, and the children have to stay inside for most of the day sitting on little wooden chairs. Teal joined him in his complaint. I heard they also don't have hammocks or experiment areas. The children cannot make anything without asking the adults first, and then they all have to make the same thing, and they teach the children all about the things they learned hundreds of years ago. That's just so silly, cut in Milo. Who can imagine learning about things which aren't true anymore? These thoughts made Till suddenly excruciatingly hungry and a little sad as she remembered that she had last eaten four hours ago when Emmeline and her popgeray bird up on her onion-shaped treehouse. Milo, are you ready to eat? I don't think our conversation is doing us any good. Perhaps after eating some food I can think of a fabulous solution for all of the children of Earth. I heard that Tanias is interested in talking to them. Can you believe that? Anyway, I'm going to find Mum and Dad and see if they want to make food with us. Good idea, Teal. All this sad talk and concentration makes my tummy rumbly. And his stomach did let out a little low growl at that moment to prove what he had said. 